Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Katie Peace. I'm the Director of Communications for the Preservation League of New York State. If you found your way to this webinar but are not familiar with the League, I will give you just a brief intro of who we are. Uh, we are a nonprofit statewide historic preservation organization. We are focused on investing in the people and projects who make historic preservation uh, part of community revitalization, sustainable economic growth, and protection of our historic buildings and landscapes all over New York State. Um, and we do that in several ways, uh, through technical services, through grant making, including our signature grant programs, Preserve New York and Technical Assistance Grants, which is a regrant partnership with uh, New York State Council on the Arts, our seven save list of endangered historic sites, our Excellence in Historic Preservation Awards, which the nominations for that will be opening very soon, so stay tuned, um, public policy and advocacy on local, state, and federal levels, our endangered properties intervention program loans, and of course, through programs like this. So we are really excited today uh, to have an esteemed panel join us to talk about the intersection of sustainability and preservation. It's a really important topic. Um, it's something that I think we need to be talking more about, and we are excited to be welcoming um, Nikita, Evan, Melissa, and Angel today to talk about this. Um, so I will do just a quick intro of our panelists. Um, Nikita Reed is an associate at Quinn Evans in Baltimore. Her work focuses on sustainable strategies in design and construction, especially as it relates to the preservation, restoration, and adaptive reuse of historic buildings. Uh, Nikita hosts the podcast Tangible Remnants. Uh, she's also a co-founder of Black and Historic Preservation. Uh, today, she's going to be focusing kind of big picture sustainability issues as it relates to preservation, um, including touching on her work with the Zero Net Carbon Collaboration, where she is a board member. Um, Evan Mason is principal of Sustainable Homes and Yards, uh, which is a residential interior design firm uh, that incorporates historic preservation and green building science with interior and space design. And she has long sought to break down the barriers between historic preservation and sustainability and is particularly interested in exploring and prioritizing ways to make that affordable for individual homeowners. Um, Melissa Oftermar, uh, her name might sound familiar if you are a fan of Hole, um, but she is, because she was their bass player, uh, but she today is here in her uh, capacity as the um, director and co-founder of Basilica Hudson and Riverhouse Project. And um, Riverhouse received an Excellence in Historic Preservation Award from the League last year, and it really is an excellent example of how sustainability can be uh, completely integrated into the restoration of a historic building. Um, and with uh, her team at Basilica, they are embarking on the next phase of that project right now as well. So we're excited that she'll be here to talk about those projects, as well as uh, the broader issue of how the cultural sector intersects with climate and preservation. Um, and then Angel Ayon is uh, a preservationist and an architect. He's also a vice chair on the League's Board of Trustees. We are really excited that he's gonna be here to moderate the conversation between our panelists at the end. So um, Angel is LEED certified. He strongly believes in sustainability as it relates to architecture and preservation. And so he is gonna be a great voice to kind of bring everybody's presentations together. So, um, as you are watching, as you're listening to our panelists speak, if you have questions for them, please do drop them in the Q&A box. Uh, when Angel kind of takes over at the end to moderate that conversation, he will be incorporating as many audience questions as possible. Uh, the chat box is also open. Feel free to use that um, to chat, to post links, to ask questions that are kind of more general. I will be hanging out in the chat. Um, so if you need anything, but otherwise uh, Q&A box is the place to be. And then um, I'm gonna hand it over to Nikita now to start her presentation. Um, and I hope that you all enjoy it. And thank you all so much for being here. We're really excited to, to have this conversation today. Awesome, well, thank you, Katie. And let me go ahead and um, share my screen real quick. Oh, sorry, there we go. Um, bear with me just one second this one and share. All right, so uh, Katie, can you confirm you can see it? 
Yes, I can. Great. Okay. Um, all right. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to have a really great conversation about the intersection of preservation and sustainability. And if you're on this call, then hopefully you already know that these two things are not mutually exclusive. You'd be surprised how many people still look at me with a little bit of a side eye when I say that sustainable or that preservation is inherently sustainable, like so many other practitioners do. Um, and so if it wants to go forward, there we go. Um, so typically architecture, preservation, and sustainability are often thought of in three different discipline silos. Um, architecture, I went ahead and took it all the way back to Vitruvius and listed firmness, commodity, and delight, um, because why not? Uh, preservation, it's often thought of as preserving, conserving, protecting what's already here. And then sustainability is really the intersection of the environment, the economy, and equity. Um, and while all of these things are often thought of as three distinct different disciplines that have their own connections and their own um, individual silos. For me, it's really about, it's our present and it's about their future in the sense where we are, the three quotes that I have on the screen really get to kind of the essence of what preservation and sustainability mean to me, particularly because so often we like to think that it's only about the past, but really it's a conversation we're trying to have um, with our past about our future. And so the, the idea is that we don't inherit the earth from our parents, we borrow it from our children, that preservation is a conversation with our past about our future, and also that sustainability without equity is sustaining inequity. So these are the three thoughts that I typically am thinking through as I'm talking about preservation and sustainability and architecture and how all of these things work together. Uh, because as we saw, even from all of the events and disruptions in 2020, all of these systems are really interconnected. And we all need to be mindful of how each of these things impact each other um, and be thinking very holistically about how the systems work together. Uh, and so part of this conversation I want to have is how, as professionals, we need to make sure that we're breaking out of our silos. So um, this is a look at various organizations that exist across the fields of preservation, architecture, and sustainability. And so you have uh, APT, which is the Association for Preservation Technology, U.S. ICOMOS on the preservation scale, in addition to great groups like the New York Preservation League that are doing conversations like this. Uh, we also then have NOMA, which is the National Organization of Minority Architects, AIA. American Institute of Architects. And then from a sustainability standpoint, we have USGBC, Architecture 2030. And then some of the newer organizations, or maybe newer to me, they've probably been around for many years, um, are the Passive House Accelerator, the Carbon Leadership Forum, and then also Climate Heritage Network. And so one of the things that the Zero Net Carbon Collaboration is looking to do within preservation is really make sure to get out or get preservation out of the silos and make sure that we are having conversations with all of these organizations. And so uh, the Zero Net Carbon Collaboration, uh, I'm one of the co-chairs along with Lori Ferris of Goody Clancy, Scott Henson of Scott Henson Architect, and also, um, excuse me, Mark Thompson Brandt of MTB Architects in Canada. And so we're looking at this and trying to make sure that we're having these conversations. Um, the organization was co-founded by an aggregation of APT, AIA, US ICOMOS, uh, RAIC out of Canada, uh, as well as um, Architecture 2030, realizing that we really need to make sure that we have existing and heritage buildings in the climate action conversation. And so as the world is moving towards zero net carbon, we need to make sure that heritage structures are not left out of that conversation, because there's no way that we're going to build our way new to carbon neutral. So we need to make sure that we are making space for heritage structures to be in this conversation without destroying the historic fabric, without um, doing things that aren't going to be great for um, the building, the community, community, the heritage, and just being mindful of how we make all these things work together. And so the, um, I know this is going a little quickly, but the, the project that I'm going to talk about is uh, Baltimore Penn Station in Baltimore, Maryland. And so um, the framework that we typically use at Quinn Evans to talk through our projects is AIA's design excellence. And so three of the 10 elements that I'll talk through really quickly are um, energy, community, and change for this particular project. Um, so Penn Station is on Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. It is the eighth busiest station for Amtrak uh, in the country. And also passenger rail, as many of you know, it, ha it reduces less CO2 per passenger um, than other modes of transportation. And so one of the things with this project that we're working with 
um, particularly since the building is a Baltimore historic landmark, we're going after historic tax credits, um, and the building itself is has a deep history in the community. Um, even though unfortunately the building has fallen into a severe state of disrepair. The first floor where the um, where the entrance to the trains and platforms are and the platform level, those are still heavily used, but the two or I guess the three stories above are not used. And so all of that is going to be renovated and um, adaptively reused into office space and other tenant space to actually bring this back up to highest and best use for the area for the community. And so one of the struggles that um, we're having with this project and that many historic properties have is that the building is actually located in a floodplain. And so one of the things that I wanted to mention about the notion of sustainability is that it's not just solar panels, it's not just the community, it's also paying attention to siding, materials, resiliency. And so um, sometimes figuring out how you're going to best protect the historic structure, uh, you have to be a little bit creative with it. And so for this particular building, we are actually having to uh, employ a couple different flood proofing techniques. So both wet flood proofing and dry flood proofing, in addition to doing additional other renovations throughout the building. Um, but being able to keep this building in this location, still serving the community, still serving um, the region, and also, I guess, the Northeast Corridor, um, creating more jobs in this space, making sure that the residents who live near this building will have less blight to look at without destroying the history that's there. So it's looking at how preservation can really be a touchstone to multiple different points in this community um, without necessarily just saying, oh, we're, we're going to just do some sort of sustainable technology on the building, really looking at sustainability from a more holistic point of view. And then um, this is just more of a detail in case anyone is curious about a little bit more of what we're doing. But yes, we are actually going to let this level of the um, building flood when needed for those uh, rare 100 flood zone or 100, 100 year flood events. Yes, we've gotten approval from uh, the SHPO and from the local historic preservation. And the issue with, well, there's a number of issues that we just don't have time to get into at the moment. But um, just wanted to mention other ways to think about resiliency and bringing resiliency into the conversation for preservation on that one. Um, and I know that was super fast and covered a bunch of things, but thank you. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Evan. Thank you. Let's see, I have to share my screen. Come on, there I am. And let me get my screen. Thank you. Um, uh, the. Um, your presentation makes me think a little bit about Fadley's um, uh, crab cakes, which are the best for anybody who hasn't, hasn't been to Baltimore. <laughs> um, anyway, um, my name is Evan Mason and I have an interior design firm where I seek to, inter, inter, to join historic preservation, interior design, uh, sustainability, and uh, to, to, to make it all kind of work together. I'm also on the board of the New York League of Conservation Voters, and I just uh, survived um, over 100 interviews with city council, uh, prospective city council um, members. Um, and one of the things that's highlighted for me is um, how much policy there is that's being made now as we speak. And um, I worry that the historic preservationists are not at the table as much as they should be. They don't have enough. Um, impact. Um, this slide is just a representation of a project I did, the sort of before and after, where uh, I, I looked at, I'll, I'll revisit it later, but I looked at um, insulation, um, mechanicals, um, and interior design and tried to pull it all together with uh, historic preservation. Um, um, I look at historic preservation and sustainability and affordable housing as three legs of a stool. And I've long sought, sought to pull these things together. And it occurred to me that we've been criticized in the historic preservation field of being too expensive, elite, out of touch. Um, we have been, and so is the sustainability field. Um, except for now with climate change, there is a real um, uh, call to action and um, uh, you, know, you might say a, a, an agreement that we have to do um, something. Um, why is this not working? 
Um, so climate change, greenhouse gases, uh, uh, rising sea waters and resiliency. And my question to all of you that are on this call um, is how can historic preservation get a seat at the environmental table as the sausage is being made? Um, and, and maybe, and excuse me, maybe we are more than I know, but, may, but it seems to me that we're not. Um, it seems to me that historic preservation is often seen as irrelevant or annoyingly intrusive. Why aren't you letting me replace my windows? Why aren't you uh, letting me do what I want? Um, we constantly have to fight um, that with the notion that new is always better. Um, and we also have to fight uh, as sustainability experts and, and, and uh, practitioners do. It's really hard to find good contractors and tradespeople that really know or care about historic preservation or sustainability. There's actually a lot in common. Um, there's a lot of overlap in the skill sets and, uh, but it's really hard to find the right people to do the job and at a price that's affordable. Um, and then, um, uh, but I think there's good news as well. People uh, are appreciating historic neighborhoods. Uh, they're moving, there's retrofitting, there's renovations, there's a rethinking of indoor and outdoor spaces. And I think there is an opportunity uh, for us to get on this, this bandwagon. Um, and, um, and I think there's also opportunities for blended green and historic preservation uh, jobs trainings. Um, I think there's going to be funding in that area with, with green building. And since there, I think there's a lot of overlap, perhaps there's um, a, a potential for joint and blended job training. Why is this? There we go. Um, Indian Point is closing tomorrow, for those of you who, who sort of passed that by. New Indian Point provided 25% of New York City's power, um, and, um, and uh, the New York City buildings account for 70% of the city's greenhouse gas emissions. And as you, many of you know, 50% of the New York City buildings were built before uh, 1930. So there are a lot of historic buildings that are going to need some upgrades. Policy is being made now on both the state and the local level levels. I'm just gonna focus a little bit here on New York City, the Climate Mobilization Act, which covers buildings over 25,000 square uh, feet and aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2000, um, 2030 and 80% by 2050, it's going to be a heavy lift. And for the, those of you who have small buildings or small homes that aren't, are under 25,000 square feet, I think we all need to take the lessons of what can be done uh, to make all our own uh, buildings uh, more um, energy efficient. On the, um, on the state level, many of you know that the CLCPA is uh, being uh, developed as we speak. And my question is, are we represented on these advisory um, councils? And if not as much as we need to be, then how can we get more um, in, involved and more active? Um, going back to New York City, for uh, those of you who don't know, um, local law 3395 are going to be putting great letter grades on all buildings greater than 25,000 square feet. And it's going to be, it's been very effective on restaurants and it's going to be a little um, disturbing for some buildings who don't have good store, uh, scores. This is um, uh, where it gets a little tough. My building that I live in is in the Ansonia and we get a D. Um, and living in the building as much as I love it and as much as I appreciate it, I also understand why it's got a three out of a hundred. Um, but I also want to look at um, the Beresford, which is just up the street, and I know is an extremely well-managed building. It gets an A. Uh, Manhattan House, uh, which is built in the 50s, gets a D, uh, but is still a lot higher than in the Ansonia. So it's just sobering um, to look at how much work you know, we all have to do um, and, um, and how we can really analyze and be proactive and develop plans going forward. 
So my question is, where are we as profession as preservationists in this discussion? Some of the things that I thought about um, are, are the areas in, in a building, the roof, the building envelope, mechanicals, lighting and appliances, water quality and landscaping. And I wanna pull your attention over to what I call pain points. Knowing uh, in the historic preservation world, uh, renewable sightings, view shed issues, um, there's uh, um, some buildings are uh, installing ethos on the outside to improve insulation. Uh, window upgrades, all, always source spots. Um, and then there's also uh, an issue of, of, of the placement of exterior wall chases for compressors, refrigerant lines, and vents that are needed for energy efficient heat pumps and, and um, ERVs, um, which are help with good ventilation. And then I have over here on the right, who is really going to do a good job at air sealing? How do you find skilled and sensitive workers? How are we going to think proactively to uh, make our buildings as energy efficient as we can? A friend of mine sent me these pictures um, and of a job that he recently com um, completed up in um, upstate New York or near Albany, where they just did insulation and they replaced the low efficiency boilers and they improved the reduction of, of um, gas um, by 20% in the first year. So it's, there's a lot of work to be done, but it can be done. Um, this is uh, uh, some pictures of uh, installation of a heat pump on a 20 unit building on the Upper West Side and uh, it's so much more energy efficient than the uh, atmospheric boilers you saw on the previous um, um, picture, see the previous slide, and also much more space efficient, um, as you can see by this huge steam boiler on the next, on the, on the bottom um, slide. So what can we do as, in, uh, as individuals and professionals in our personal lives and our professional lives? I think we need to start to develop a long-term energy and carbon reduction strategy today. We can start with energy audits and reports if we have them, our local law 87 reports if you're in New York City. Um, we can evaluate our building systems to identify ways to optimize energy use. We need to think and act proactively. And going back to the pictures where I highlighted a few New York City historic buildings, I think that the better managed buildings will be better prepared. And the less managed, well-managed buildings will incur hefty fines. Um, here's a, a picture that I took uh, on Long Island on the left of a smaller building. And they're looking at, you know, obviously as they do their renovation and their recladding, they're looking at good building envelope tightness. And um, as somebody who's lived in a brownstone, I have to, I can attest to you that stack effect is a huge issue, both in uh, resident comfort and in terms of energy efficiency. And I just wanna call that to attention because it, the stack effect where the negative pressure rises up through a building is often overlooked. And it accounts for those people who have really hot apartments up above and very low, uh, very uh, cold apartments down below. And um, then all the people in the uh, upper floors open their windows and um, make the people down below even colder. Um, the picture on the right, I want, I looked at um, a couple of weeks ago, it's a building on the Upper West Side, where they installed incredibly inefficient window air conditioners on every single apartment in that, uh, in that building, which is just a lot of holes in a building, which are most likely not going to be removed in the wintertime, and is just going to be a, a huge uh, waste of energy instead of looking at how they could have developed a better uh, heating and cooling through heat pump installations. Um, this coming down to a smaller scale on a residential, the picture on the upper left shows how cold this brownstone was. That This up here on the upper left, it, it relates to 50 degrees. 
And that's largely because of stack effect and poor insulation. When uh, the, the, we blew in insulation and we did this infrared camera imaging when we located where the holes in the exterior were that we couldn't see, but the air was finding, uh, finding its way in, we were able to target our, our, um, our, our um, insulation and, um, and, and um, uh, repairs on the outside. Um, an easy upgrade or lighting. Um, I am a big fan of $23 uh, sensors for both bathroom uh, fans and um, vestibules, especially in like brownstones where your people are walking up and down the uh, floors, the, the stairs um, all the time and don't remember to turn on their lights. It's such an easy and inexpensive intervention. So what I wanted to do is sort of call, make a call to action. Where do historic preservation, sustainability, and affordable housing affordability natural overlap, naturally overlap? Where can we work together to develop green jobs that are also historic preservation jobs? How can we educate ourselves? How can we push ourselves to get more involved and more educated about sustainability policies as they are being um, developed and how can we get our or in. And with regard to some of the pain points that I talked about before, what do we really think and feel about the possibility of those potential impacts? The uh, replacement of historic windows with triple pane windows. We, wh how, how we really have to look inside ourselves and then this last uh, bullet point really points to the fact that at least in New York City, real estate owners, property owners are now making recommendations to an advisory council, to the mayor. And are we in that conversation? That's really my question to, to everybody here. And with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Melissa who has an incredible space that I actually was privileged to attend a uh, wedding in. Well, excellent, thank you. I have, uh, first of all, thanks to the League for putting together this uh, conversation. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. I have so much uh, feedback on both Nikita and Evan. I mean, Evan, one of the things I will be talking about the blended job training. I'm all, one of our projects has done all the windows, the heat pumps, the envelope, envelope tightness. So all of these things are music to my ears. And Nikita, I was um, excited to hear about the Baltimore train station, Basilica, which is going to be where we start this conversation, is um, uh, on the Amtrak uh, line as well, and next to the Hudson Historic Train Station. We're the third busiest in the state, and we are in a floodplain as well. So I'm going to speak really from a place of, um, uh, as opposed to the two other presenters, a very place-based specific case studies. So I am not a preservation specialist. My husband and I uh, moved to Hudson over a decade ago and essentially fell in love with two old buildings. And the, the builder that he is and the uh, systems person that he is and the people person that I am built out these two buildings in this way that I feel like we want to help be examples of, uh, of, of what can happen in green historic preservation, as well as how can the cultural sector amplify these voices and stories and, and, and places. So um, first slide is uh, Basilica Hudson. Uh, you, know, you can move, sorry, I have Katie doing the slides for me because I can't screen share. Okay, so nope, slide, yes, thank you. So Basilica Hudson, uh, was co-founded by my husband and I. He's a filmmaker. I'm a musician. It's a reclaimed 1880s factory on the Hudson River. I'm going to dive into both buildings a little bit to give context of where we are now. So Basilica turned 10 last year, which is a big pivoting moment for us. But essentially, we reclaimed this beautiful building and did the first phase. We went solar right away. We did some of the windows. We brought water and electric. Um, there was nothing and it's seasonal. So one of the exciting um, reasons that we're, we're, we're embarking on this conversation is that we are about to enter a, a big new chapter of restoration of the Basilica. But we are an art center 
uh, with a mission to bring innovative uh, independent voices in arts and culture. So it's large music festivals, uh, farm and flea markets, um, community gatherings, uh, and private rentals to pay the bills. So next slide is um, uh, the sister project. So the River House project is a reclaim 1902 uh, elementary school. It overlooks, it's on a bluff overlooking Basilica and they, and we live uh, in between the two buildings from our personal residence. We see one out the front, one out the back and they to us speak to what reclaiming and bringing life back to these incredible architectural feats, but also these places that were built on an old civilization. And uh, in many ways, we see the reclaiming of the industrial factory as, you know, uh, reclaiming, uh, bringing people into an industrial wasteland, and then the reclaiming of the education uh, center, which is a very different use than the other one is really a public event center. And this one is a film media innovation and design hub. And um, it really was about being an anchor to the creative economy that was moving to the area, but also encouraging uh, professionals to take root outside of major cities to kind of bring the professional uh, industries uh, to more regional um, and rural environment places. So this building was the one that we uh, next slide, I believe, says we won an exciting preservation award last year in 2020. This was an incredible, oh, um, go back to that just so I can explain a bit. So Tony Stone, my hus husband, next slide, you'll see the interior, which I believe, so our commitment was to obviously reclaim and give life to this beautiful place, but also to do it as green as possible. The first thing Tony did himself was cut the gas line out of the building. So we're completely HVAC, you know, so it was all about the envelope on the, the roof, on the, in the bottom, in the belly, on the windows, insulation where we could, but because we were working in historic preservation, we obviously couldn't do the insides or the outsides of the walls. And Tony's love of figuring out how to prove that you can do a historic building while still being green and energy conscious. So this has been, I, th I think is probably why we won the award other than it's gorgeous. <laughs> um, so there's some before and afters in there. And uh, the schoolhouse was also how we discovered that just a passion mom and pop project, uh, we employed local um, people for over three years, up to 40 people at a time. And we trained most of them because as Evan mentioned, there's not a lot of people who are both an amazing carpenter or know about HVAC. So Tony single-handedly project managed it and brought the HVAC people into this realm of historic restoration, brought the old school carpenters into the realm of, of high tech green energy. So. Um, next slide is to show that these are the backbones of our two spaces are examples of individual passion project work, but also has brought us into a, a much more activated uh, question now. And this is where we're really going to be, um, I guess, continuing the conversation of how I feel that the cultural sector and the culture activities, whether it's filmmakers and professionals that generally are quite progressive in their, you know, so the, a lot of the people who rent at the schoolhouse is because we are part of a like-minded community of restoring and driving electric cars, or, you know, all of the, 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 the good sort of, if you have money, spend it well, if you want to support causes, support good causes. And then the uh, Basilica is this question of we're a public event space and in 2020, um, Oh, yes, here I have a little note that says Shippo Nicerta made it possible. So what's incredible is that both buildings showcase green and historic restoration, but really we are hoping to inspire others in New York State to follow suit and go into the next slide, which is really where I'm putting the majority of my um, uh, nonprofit focus and mission is that with 2020, the pandemic coming, I'm sure everyone on this call felt, you know, the trillions that are going to go into rebuilding our economy due to pandemic and, and, and obviously all the lives that have been affected so dramatically, we just lost a lot of the infrastructure money that we needed to put into green infrastructure. So it could droople my commitment to how can our buildings directly help and solve some of the most crucial crises. And then obviously with the incredible Black Lives Matter explosion that happened during the pandemic, it really enhanced and changed and we're responding to 
the needs of our immediate environment. And back to us being a place-based thing is that we, I'm really focusing on our block in our neighborhood, is that how can we as cultural uh, voices with historic buildings play a significant role in changing the infrastructure and changing individuals and the way that they um, are responding to the needs, uh, which is climate and equity crisis, socioeconomic crisis. And what's incredible that the city of Hudson itself is it's a very progressive elected body right now. And in fact, the next half of this presentation will be dovetailing off of a presentation I did at the Sustainable um, uh, Futures Conference this week, which is how can private cultural, private projects work with public and work with the city. And right now we're developing um, in our next 10 year strategic plan, a core workforce training pilot program to be pathways to 21st century jobs which will start with green and historic trades because the net zero campus, next slide, uh, that we are embarking on Basilica, it's a two year training opportunity. And the city of Hudson itself has a demographic much, much like New York City or Baltimore, where there is 25% African-American living under the poverty line in housing projects, which are, you know, my goal and dream is to work with the city of Hudson. If we can find, uh, really incredible training opportunities and jobs for those who don't have a training and pathways to jobs outside of say, what is in the Hudson Valley, uh, most of it right now is tourism and um, kind of you know, elements of for good and for bad gentrification components that if we can start creating these trades jobs and directly working with our um, most underserved community, we could then be a template for other major cities that have a very similar demographic and similar need, which is that we need to learn these trades. We need to be able to insulate and make that building tight while having the solar and the Tesla battery chargers, all that. We need all of that, but we need handy workers. So this is our commitment right now is to take advantage because we saw with the schoolhouse restoration that we trained people who now work in historic preservation, that didn't work in that before. They were either didn't have a job or they were artists or they were, so we watched me what it was like to train people and to give them a pathway to this uh, to a job. And we wanna be able to make sure to capture that. So we're developing this pilot program, um, next slide, to directly respond to what we see as need is that the city of Hudson, just like any city, needs to insulate their buildings, needs to leverage all of the incentives that are there between tax credits, between NYSERDA. So how could we just sort of be teachers by making our cases transparent? And that's where the, the cultural institutions come into play is we can amplify these stories to essentially be beacons of of what other people, you know, our goal and our dream is that if we do these projects these ways, that other institutions and in historic buildings in the Hudson Valley or elsewhere will look to us and try to replicate that program. It also works in that the city of Hudson itself, if you are a generous, mindful, green historic developer, you give them a template so that when other developers come to town, even if it's not historic, but even say when it's time to upgrade the public housing or when a big hotel developer comes, they have a backbone of, you know what, this is, there's a, there's an incentive to, to sort of ask that these are what these other people did. They did job training, they followed green uh, fossil fuel principles. And so we're trying to kind of build a toolkit for, to empower the city, because right now what we need to do is empower our elected officials and what's exciting about arts and cultures and uh, orga organizations is that we can amplify these stories and, and that our audiences are voters. And if we want to support, someone mentioned uh, one of the other climate uh, investment acts, but the Climate Community Investment Act that's right now uh, uh, being reviewed by the Senate in New York State is one of the most um, progressive acts in the country to connect climate with jobs. So we are both trying to amplify the voices and make sure that um, that we mobilize the, the change that has to happen. Last slide, I believe, which was kind of where I wanted to leave this conversation was our buildings are saying something, but what can our public facing institutions say to sort of broad general audience, but also going into the arts and culture sector, which is where people socialize. And that a lot of environmental or even 
uh, preservation lead, there's like someone mentioned earlier about the elite kind of class is that it is, is it, where can we bring that conversation you know, on the ground, at a farmer's market, at a film screening, in a more, uh, you know, wh where it penetrates the soul and the heart. And that's where I feel as a, a former rock musician turn art center, turn, you know, green historic trades program developer, I feel like we as citizens have the obligation to uh, walk the walk, but also talk it to your neighbors and your friends. And that's, that's I guess, last slide is I think saying thank you for, <laughs> for having me. And I hope that any of you can come visit our, our buildings. We're very proud of them and we're very proud of the green and preservation component. And the Basilica will be under transformation um, in the Hudson Valley in the next two years. And we hope it will be a um, well, Columbia Green Community College. Yes, we will be speaking with them in fact um, about how to make them accredited uh, um, trainings. That's it. Thank you. I don't know how long that was. <laughs> that was so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, that was a lot of information and there was a lot of thoughts. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much to the three of you and for Katie for bringing us together. My name is Angel Ayon. I'm from Ayon Studio Architecture and Preservation in New York City and uh, I'm delighted to be here to continue this conversation and facilitate uh, a conversation about uh, the uh, really important critical issues that, that you all referred to. I, I just want to start by mentioning that I, I listening to President Biden's uh, uh, last night at, at at his presentation in Congress and how he was actually emphasizing his commitment to have the, not only to have the US committed to, to the Tokyo, uh, to the Paris Agreement and so on, but, but cutting carbon emissions by half <laughs> uh, by 2030, right? So that's a huge challenge. So, so all of these things that we have uh, in place are exciting and so on, but they may not be enough. <laughs> to really meet uh, the policy challenges that are coming now from Washington. So, so I think the first question that I have uh, is uh, for any, all of you is, what are the fundamental policy issues that uh, we, we need to change that, uh, that we need to fight for? Um, Melissa, you, you, in one of your last slides, you were talking about, you know, we got to fight for, for policy changes. Evan, you, you mentioned that as well, so, so did you, Nikita. But what exactly are we talking about? Any, any concrete ideas that you can uh, uh, propose that, that one need to, to change at a policy level, uh, whether it's at the federal, state, uh, or, or local level? My feeling is that we have to accept the reality that the sustainability folks run the show. And we are gonna be lucky if we get to be on that train. And so we have to get our influence. Uh, I mean, ideally we'd get on the advisory councils and the advisory councils, and we'd be able to make recommendations with the, with the folks that are making policy. But if we can't get on those councils in, in, in you know, say on the state level or certainly New York City, then we're going to have to uh, comment. We're going to be having to petition. We're going to have to figure out who to talk to so that our concerns um, get get heard. And I also think we have to fight more. To, um, uh, I mean, each one of us has to look into ourselves and educate ourselves. Uh, you know, what are the laws that are being promulgated, and how do they impact us, and how, what do we feel about them? That's my. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's also recognizing that it's not an either or, but a both and. And so it's one of those things where, as Evan pointed out, the number of different mechanical systems and things that could be retrofitted into buildings. Um, electrification is coming, and that's going to have a huge impact. But when, it, when you think about it, electrification, that's really the systems of the building and how the building works. It's not necessarily going to be what the building looks like. So there's a number of sustainable things that you can do to a building that's not going to negatively impact the historic character of the building. So you just have to be able to find those trade-offs, but then also it's making sure that we're being cognizant of 
how that change is happening because I think equity is a huge piece of this and we need to make sure that we're being more mindful of what's being preserved, how it's being preserved, widening the narrative, making sure that we're not making it seem like, oh, well, because it's historic, it can't be sustainable, it can't be touched because that's going to kind of further that divide between preservationist and sustainability advocates thinking that it's one or the other when really it's a both and. Yeah, I mean, that funny debate about the historic versus preservation, uh, anytime I bring that up, but it's funny, people might question, it's like, you're literally recycling a building. So there is no conversation. You are reusing the materials. You're not gonna uh, have to use more steel. So like, uh, to me, it's just an obvious thing that reclaiming a building is is sustainable, regenerative way of, of moving forward. Uh, but to, and the electrification is very exciting and much needed. And then I think I was going to speak to the specific policy I mentioned that Basilica, although an art center, we are moving more into this. Moment. We're going to be doing an info session in two weeks on the Climate Community Investment Act uh, that was developed by the Environmental Advocates of New York, as well as um, New York Renews, an incredible uh, grassroots. So I don't know what Maryland, for example, has, but it might be interesting. We're going to keep it. See, this New York State is being reviewed by the Senate right now, and it is directly, essentially, taxing the polluters and taking the majority of that 50 million a year they calculate, going 30% of it going into uh, equity job training in, in neighborhoods and communities that have been most hard hit and underserved. So that's like one example of a policy that the moment that one came, they were developing it. And that to me was the first time I could go to anyone and say, we are talking about the same thing, climate and jobs, equity and everyone's future, sustainability for all regenerate. It's all the same. And they have this incredible um, on New Yorker news. I can't speak highly enough, but they have a point of unity that I just copy paste that when I send an email to someone. And it's just, we are all in this together and we can and we can find a way to celebrate that and not be nitpicky. But I do realize that a lot of it has to do with presenting this story, story and a narrative that is inclusive of all. As soon as you get into, which is like the tough part about rising waters or fossil, you know, like carbon emissions, you get into the science talk and people get all fragmented and people don't know how to get back together, which is why I've been really Kind of just sort of like coming the forefront of like art centers and artists can help tell, do this because we just got to continue reminding like a song tells you that you know we are all one <laughs> it's just like <laughs> keep reminding people we're doing this together and it's not me against you and in fact that division is coming usually from places that are trying to pit us against each other and we aren't so it's just like that's where i kind of just get uh, the soul of the artist part of me of just we're just going to like renovate Basilica we're going to talk to our mayor we're going to support New York State policies because we like life and we want it to survive I mean so I don't know that's sort of a question but it is both windows policies in your heart and like like you said I'm going to look inside yourself and we each do have to whether you own your house or not every one of us has to do those tiny little things whether it's composting and it really it's the slow shift of culture, but not a lot of time left. So we are against a terrifying clock. And that's why we have to, even to do like the solar company we work with, and I will stop there, but like they, they have, they're responding to Governor Cuomo's five years, X amount of solar has to be, that means that every solar company in New York state has to grow 50% for the next five years. They can't even hire a new person today. So I personally want to help that Hudson Valley Solar Company to find 50 workers. Like that's mm -hmm. all I can think about is how could we, if we, how is that guy going to get to grow his company if he can't even hire? So that's a, you know, it's like the small and the, the big. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the things I wanted to add on, sorry. So one of the things that, um, so through the zero net carbon collaboration where we have some members who are Europe in the UK and other places. And so we've also been trying to aggregate different case studies, different policy examples, different reports. Because one of the things that we're finding with some of the local um, city members who are part of the collaboration is that they want to do what's right. They want to put the right things in their RFPs, but they just, they don't have the language yet. So like, what can we do to help fill the gap to give them the language that's needed to put in to the policies, the RFPs and all of the things so we can can then go forward and hire the practitioners to do the work that needs to be done to meet the targets and all of those things. 
resource sharing. That's mm -hmm. what we all have to be. Yes. And I feel very lucky to have now met the two of you because I feel like you'd be a good resource to us. Thank you. Um, but, but, I, but I think it's also important to, to, to be introspective and, and really understand that it's not, if we really have to make a fundamental rapid change and, and while doing so, be mindful of the, the, the heritage component that we take care of, we also have to look at ourselves and, and, and look at our practices and policies. And I think that is a fundamental question to be asked that I want to ask you how, how preservation may need to change uh, and evolve to really to meet those goals to, because we're out of time, because the, the stakes are very high, because, because we, don't want, we don't want it to be just about sustainability. We want to make the argument that preservation is still about sustainability. But those positions sometimes are really different, right? Uh, and I, I, for instance, I wonder, you know, we have this 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 sacrosanct of, uh, uh, interest in retaining the historic character and appearance at all costs and all time. In New York City, if you are putting solar panels and you show more than 12 inches of solar panels, you got to get that approved for public hearing. Um, do we need to relax a uh, certain set of regulations or precepts from uh, historic preservation? Some of the tenets of historic preservation, to what extent they may need to uh, adapt to this? I'm, I'm thinking specifically, can we, do we need to be a little bit more flexible about the integration of photovoltaics in historic panels? If this is what is coming, because we know that electrification is coming, because it makes sense to put solar panels on buildings. But if we only can only put it on the roof, or if they cannot be really seen at all, is that an issue? And I, I will put another one. If we do, we need to change the policy that if you have a building that is eligible uh, to the National Register of Historic Places, doesn't really have to meet energy conservation code. So oh, is oh. that reasonable? Is that something that needs to change? I'm working on a project yes. where it's a garage conversion to office. We're not meeting energy conservation code. We're not insulating those walls. We don't have to. It's, it, we don't have to. It, it's just, that's the law. So does that need to change? How, how does preservation need to change? That's what I, the question I would pose to you. So I'll, I'll take a stab at this to, I'll jump in first. So for the solar panel thing, um, one of the stories I'll tell really quickly, when I was studying abroad in Plymouth, England, talking to a conservationist over there, because it's conservation, not preservation. Um, one of the things that he told me is that we have castles older than your country. You guys treat your buildings too precious. And so it's one of those things where that became something that I kept thinking about the fact that um, buildings can change. And so it's how we're able to really interpret them and realize that it's okay to see a little bit of the solar panel or rather it could be okay. Um, and so being mindful that we are not uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but also people need to be in buildings to be good stewards of buildings. And if people cannot afford to be in their buildings, and if the, so we have to keep the economics of preservation in the forefront as well. Um, but again, not just throwing it all out and saying, okay, we'll slap solar panels over everything and completely destroy the historic character. The second thing um, is that the codes are changing. So for instance, as of, I think it was 2015 International Code Council for the um, Building Code, any any building that is any certified historic building, um, if it's doing level alteration three or higher, so if you are renovating more than 50% of the square footage of the building, then you do actually have to comply with the energy code, even if it is certified historic, unless you get something in writing from the SHPO or the um, architect that says, well, doing this will destroy the historic character. So I do believe that code is going to start to come for historic preservation, particularly on the energy side, because it is possible for many buildings to be made more sustainable. Um, but I think often there's been such resistance between the fields to think that it can't be done. But I think now it's, um, now it's more of a show your work, make an attempt, show us that you can or tell us why you can't, as opposed to just blanketly saying that you can't because it's on the National Register. Uh, because as many people know, just because a building is on the National Register does not mean it cannot be torn down. Um, just can't be torn down if you're using federal funds. So it's one of those things we need to be more mindful of that. Or, or, or it doesn't mean that it cannot be renovated with a sustainable mind. <laughs> I, I also am of the mind that you want to exceed the energy code. Um, and and um, I think it's really important because the small buildings that don't have as, as high a bar to jump through, they end up suffering in, in terms of less comfort. Like when I showed the slides of the stack effect and how cold that kitchen was, because they didn't have to jump through a, a high energy code bar because it was such a small place, 
they the the owners were cold. <laughs> So um, it's it's really, uh, and then I think we really haven't talked a lot about operations and maintenance. You know, uh, sometimes older buildings are not efficient because they're not well maintained, not because they're not good structures. So I think uh, when people do any kind of intervention, whether it's a, a, a small job or a big job, a big reno or a major reno, um, they need to look at those entry points as opportunities to really upgrade the systems, improve their sustain their energy efficiency, um, and lower their maintenance uh, their operations costs as they go as they go forward. And I would say that um, <clears throat> that, that back to the blending of the historic and the green, like the SHPO and the NYSERDA, is that we still need. Uh, more education and resources for the tradespeople to be knowing what the options are, which is a big part of our case study locally and, and why we want to make formalize this as a program is that if we can show and work with the community college and work with the buildings to show it, we need the tradespeople to be informed and armed and not just the progressive historic sustainability people. We need the people on the ground to have that information and that might be you know, and that's why we're looking at the community college and work, working with a, a small base is that we, I think there's probably code changes that have to happen, but we have two crazy old buildings and we are going to exceed the requirements. I can't, you know, like just because our hearts have decided there's no option. We have to, because there is a planet that our daughter will live on. So we don't see it as an option. Whereas you start putting these policy obligations and you know, people looking for loopholes if I don't have to do it because, but what if there was more information out there? There's just not enough information because we met with those HVAC heating and cooling people. We know friends who have historic buildings in Hudson who are not being given maybe what you do, Evan, which is give an option. Nobody's being given the non-boiler option because it's not part of the, so I see it as NYSERDA, SHPO, the state, the cities have to work together on education of the trades and information resource sharing. That to me, before we have to like do big giant code, like whatever changes, we just need to get on the ground expanded education. So that's where we're trying to just help. And because I actually, through being an advocate for the creative economy, I now sit on the New York State Council um, Regional Economic Development Council as an advocate for green and creative industries in New York State. So I feel like, and I took that to be able to learn what incentives are there, but mainly so that our projects could be amplified to the rest of the state so that we could be then have a direct conversation with someone in Albany of like, who could help us amplify this? How could we help a college expand their historic program to be more green? And what we're really hoping to do is create two case projects that can be a green envelope curriculum to the historic education preservation college um, curriculum. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, you, you mentioned, Melissa, I, I love what you were talking about, you know, how, how can cultural places amplify these, these issues or help to amplify these issues of preservation of sustainability and preservation and so on. But while you were saying, so I was thinking, well, there is this conundrum where you have these, these cultural institutions that are, uh, are cash traps uh, or, or philanthropy dependent by, by nature. And, 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 but they're so essential, right? They're so essential. And we went through a year where, you know, we were all staring online at the international museums uh, from all over the world and performances and so on. So I think if anything, this last year helped us to, re to remind, uh, to remember and to, to be so cognizant about the, the role of the arts in, in, in our lives, right? Um, so is, is there a change in policy related to preservation and sustainability that have to be uh, strictly related to engaging the arts? How, how do you see that, not from a, from a layman's, from an arts organization per perspective, not necessarily like the way we may be looking at it, which is like from a more technical, perspective, is, is this a challenge is, or is this an opportunity in terms of integrating the arts in this whole uh, movement and, and need and urgency of creating buildings for sustainable purposes? Well, it's definitely what I've been thinking about for years. And when you know we first went art and solar at the same time, and then the last year has for me been the real uh, uh, solidifier that 
um, cause I have been having a lot of arts and activism conversations in the Hudson Valley around Black Lives Matter, but all of the, the activist art that can help raise the conversation. But I do, and I found myself uh, for better or for worse, sometimes wondering, you know, do, do artists have to stop acting like artists and just act like citizens? Because really the nature of art is escapism from, you know, quite literally in the Renaissance. I mean, you're escaping the pain of the reality of the world, right? So it's actually been interesting as an art center trying to bring arts and environmentalism together has been much tougher than I thought because a lot of artists, although they are, and I don't mean I'm just artists, just art community, people who go to music and films, people who donate and wouldn't think twice about maybe, you know, paying $20 in the, the donation box, but maybe haven't thought about how environmentalism, so it's been an odd fit a little bit, but I feel really passionate that it's a natural fit, but it's just not there yet. It might be a little bit like the preservation sustainability question of just why isn't it obvious fit, but it kind of comes back to me to just uh, this resource, like the way that we started seeing it right as the pandemic hit is that we bring 40,000 people through a building every year. In 2020, I was going to make sure that every person that walked into the building would see a, we are having a net zero campus rest renovation. Take this flyer, call your representative for policy. That was how I was thinking of just slowly pass on information to every person at a time. Because when you go to an art show, you are open and seeking, right? So like I see it as like, but it's been hard uh, in fact, even just because we've been so committed, hearing some of our audience saying, well, now you're a climate environmental group. I'm, no, 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 we're not. We're, we really love, of course, the arts are here. It's just that we have to have them together because it's almost just be a citizen to the planet first and then do what you love without. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question, but it's been an odd fit, but it's my personal commitment now to connect the two and to show like, how if someone said earlier it's just there's we have to connect all of them now and it's just the climate should be at the forefront of everyone's cause is the way that and and I think artists will be fast to adapt because of the nature of flexible responsiveness but so so there are silos that that uh Nikita was talking about within the the professional field but there are also cultural silos yeah. Well, right, that 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 need to be broken down and, and people really tackle this for people to tackle this together. So and I, and in that sense, I wonder uh, and, and I love the some of the quotes that you you in uh, show on your your slideshow Nakita at the very beginning in terms of uh, sustainability without real addressing social justice is just another way to perpetuate injustices. And you can say that is that's that will be also the truth for preservation as well. So. With trillions of dollars coming into from the federal government uh, coming down for concrete projects, um, and with with the urgency of of deepening our collective understanding of social and racial injustice in this country, is is this an opportunity for preservation to be used to elevate preservation as a, as an equity or uh, uh, tool? Or uh, is this that we can use you yeah. mentioned Melissa trade of uh, trade jobs and so on well let's just give people jobs well that's one way to do it but mm -hmm. but when we're talking about disadvantaged communities have been really affected and, and even you were the one who mentioned that when you say uh, Indian coin is closing tomorrow and, and that's one of the things that we do know that uh, a lot of this pollution that happens really uh, specifically affect disadvantaged communities and prime communities of color uh, but Quite often, those are communities that still have historic resources of significance. Uh, uh, so is this an opportunity to, to tackle two uh, important issues in terms of sustainability, uh, the built environment, but also equity? Um, Anyone? Yes. Um, <laughs> short answer, yes. Um, it is all all connected. Um, and so one of the, one of the books I read last year that was really eye opening for me, which I'm sure many people read, it was one of it was one of the books in kind of a lot of the social justice circles that were going around. Um, and it was called The Color of Law. And so one of the things that, as angry as I got reading that book, and as much as I wanted to throw it across the room, um, was that 
the state that we're in right now is that it was designed to be this way. So when we say that communities of color have to bear the brunt of more environmental injustice, it's because they were designed to only be zoned in certain areas so that all of the environmental waste plants and that kind of things would go next to those communities. And so preservation, I mean, even now, right now, the National Register has only about maybe 2% of the mm -hmm. listings are for stories that don't center on heterosexual white males. And so mm -hmm. making sure that we're expanding the story. And I think preservation just has such power to really help show the beauty of this history and of the country. Um, that's not just from one perspective, because the way that preservation kind of happens in the country right now, you would think that everything that was done here was really just done by white men and that couldn't be further from the truth. So using preservation as a tool to tell more stories and to be more honest about the history of this country, I think is a huge equity tool for preservation. Um, I can't, as you may get sometimes in hell as well, the number of people who kind of give me a, a raised eyebrow when they say, wait, you're a preservationist, but I thought that's only something why white folks did. No, they're, they're, that's, it's, preservation is not just for white people. Um, and so it's one of those things we're using preservation to tell more of the story, tell more of the full story, uh, and really do it in a way that's going to be more equitable. And it's not like we're making stuff up. It's not like we're negating history. We're just trying to expand the vision because right now history has been a spotlight. We're trying to turn on the house lights and show everyone who's been in the room. I, can I jump in? Um, first of all, I didn't mention this before, but I do work in affordable housing and have done building condition surveys in all the five boroughs. And, um, and most of those buildings are pre-war, uh, like 1890s to 1915 or so. And uh, a lot of it comes down to, uh, for, to put off um, maintenance that has been put off for years and really bad building management. And when you have a committed building manager, whether it's my building, which is not affordable, um, or an affordable housing in Brooklyn, it really comes down to how the how the building is managed. And um, and so I think that HPD and other you know parts of the city government uh, have have uh, systems in place, the IPNAs, the physical needs assessments that are meant to address that. Um, I also just wanted to call attention, there was a question about financing, which um, always in every presentation I'm ever in or see is always put off on the last because nobody wants to talk about money. Um, and uh, so I just want to you know, ask my, the, my fellow panelists, but, you know, as far as I know, the pace of financing that's part of the CLCPA and the city, I guess, is, is not off the ground yet. And it's um, targeted to commercial um, buildings. I think I'm correct on that, but it's not off the ground. NYSERDA is a place to turn to for incentives. And um, maybe we can put in some chat as to, uh, you know, other sources of, of funding. But I also want to say I am not a particularly popular person with some architects and uh, contractors because I push them hard on money. Every one of my engineering friends said, oh, we just put in this heat pump system and it's great and it's affordable and it saves you all this money. And they always uh, underestimate the cost by a huge amount. And also who is paying for that? that heat pump installation? Is it the building that gets the insul insul in, uh, the incentive or is it the, the building, uh, the, the resident? So I want to ask all of the architects on, on, on here, and I wish I could see everybody's faces and the engineers, uh, we need to press people about prices because when it comes to historic preservation and sustainability, sometimes prices are inflated. Um, one of the other things I wanted to add on, which ties directly to the affordable housing piece, particularly in Baltimore. Um, so one of the studies that uh, there's a there's a doctor in Baltimore who, whenever there's a shooting in Baltimore, he goes back to see where the shooter lived. And a lot of times he'll find that the shooter actually grew up in an affordable housing project that had lead paint. And so as a child, that shooter was exposed to lead poisoning, not treated for lead poisoning, and then grew up and you know became a menace to society. And so one of the things that CHAP, which is Baltimore City's local historic preservation commission has allowed is that in any renovation, if any historic window is found to have any lead paint on it, that window window can come out without question. And so it's one of those things where that's an instance where the 
historic commission is working with public health to then deal with the built environment that is leading to conditions that are affecting brain development in children. And so that's another equity piece, which I thought of as Evan was talking about affordable housing and how we make that connection and how we really pay attention to the fact that all of these things really are connected. Um, is, is, there, is, is there a future for preservation in, in, in a net zero economy or in a net zero environment? Can we, can we talk about a little bit more specifically and granularly about that? It's, it's something that is, uh, it's, it, it already entered the policy vocabulary, right? Uh, President Biden mentioned net zero and, and that was exciting. But I think that the real question is, what, what does it really mean for, for preservation and, and to what extent, you know, when the, the policy, it's, it's starting to be there. Do you mention even the, the, the um, new legislation in New York City that, that that's for buildings that are larger than 25,000 square feet? And you, you mentioned, you know, there's the vast majority of smaller buildings that are not really getting there. So can, can we talk about what, what do we need to, in this rush to net zero, what, what, are, what are the things that are important that we need to keep in mind to make sure that, as you said, we don't throw the baby with the bath out of the window? Um, anything that you want to highlight that I think is pressing to you that, that cannot or should not be missed in this conversation? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is some of the low hanging fruit. So are we making sure that we're air sealing our buildings? Are we making sure our windows are repointed and resealed? Uh, so you're not saying buy new windows, but just make sure that the old historic windows are actually redone so that they actually are functioning correctly. Uh, we want to make sure that we are looking at our systems and upgrading our systems when possible. And mind you, those two things alone are going to have an amazing and massive impact on the energy usage of the building, and that's not touching the historic character of the building yet. And so I think that um, there's a misnomer thinking that historic buildings can't get to net zero. The issue could be that historic buildings won't be able to do renewables on their building because of policies for solar panels or, re or renewables. And so that's where that gap could come from. But we always want to make sure that we are um, reducing the energy load as much as possible before we reducing and optimizing before we start then adding renewables to it. Uh, so I think there's a process definitely for historic buildings to be able to be involved in the conversation. Um, that's 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 right. Anything else? Anyone had anything to add? I want I want to read some. I want to go quickly through some of the comments in the 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 chat that 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 really talk about uh, related to maybe this were prompted by your presentation Nikita but they talk about uh, issues of ownership and of rail railroad stations and and the entanglement between and also your your former uh, station Melissa but the, the entanglement of 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 heavily subsidized transportation systems and, and train stations that are abandoned or are put uh, for sale or for lease for private development while still be being a lease and then their tax savings and so on. So a lot of that sometimes is related to, to, to preservation. So is there anything there that we need to make sure that we also uh, work at a policy level telling the federal government, you know, what needs to change and how they need to uh, uh, act on it. I mean, in New York City, we, we're, we, we just went through this effort of the, the governor trying to change a significant amount of several blocks around Penn Station by pretty much uh, eminent domain saying we're going to demolish all these buildings. All right, you have 10 buildings that are potential landmarks, we don't care, we're still going to demolish it. And and it just it just it just the whole thing was scrapped through a budget reconciliation uh, in the middle of the night, and everyone was really surprised. But but it it could have had you know given the political climate being a little bit different in Albany, it could have had a, 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 a pass or surviving. So so what what do we? The question is what do we? How do we speak up uh, in terms of talking to uh, the fed, the state and federal governments in terms of how they should be doing their part in a, in, a, in a way that is important for us to, to get this done and to break these silos and, and accomplish some of these uh, targets. I'm going to just speak to transportation in general. And of course, you know, anyone who's been to Europe or been to, you know, the, the Amtrak being a, a location that sits on an Amtrak line and train lovers ourselves taking it across the country, you know, the the subsidizing uh, and supporting train infrastructure must happen and they must, a, a, re, a whole 
uh, investment in the infrastructure of, to be able to get us to electric rail and high speed rail and commuting, commuting. That to me, I don't think I'm answering your question, but I know that if I were thinking of federal policies and not state and city, transportation would be one of the, the biggest um, infrastructure things that I would be championing and trying to figure out how to, and that's where I got really scared with the, you know, the pandemic slash bailout of just what about the trains? <laughs> what about every, the way people move in this country? And, and, and then, you know, we haven't even gotten into once because it's more about infrastructure, but, you know, of course, food and agriculture and emissions from all the, I mean, like industrial <laughs> agriculture. So industrial agriculture and and transportation on a federal level, I feel like are the biggest, along with the federal giving the state and city incentives and money to go rebuild themselves. That to me seems to be the layman sort of broad stroke because I feel like federal has to give us money to work locally. And then we have to think about the biggest emissions um, that are across the country, which uh, agri industrial agriculture and transportation, but I don't, yeah, I don't know if that just sort of off the cuff what I know I feel is really desperately important in the US. Uh, Evan, you, 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 I know you, you have really entrenched in, in, in issues for New York City. Uh, anything that on the policy level you think that, that still needs to change? I mean, the, the city has been uh, forthcoming and pioneering in establishing all of these policies, but, and, and everyone is looking at New York to see to what extent what is, gets legislated here uh, survives or, or is effective, but, but can, should they be more aggressive? And if so, what, 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 do, what else needs to be done at a policy level uh, uh, that you can think of? Uh, it's, it's funny, I, first of all, this is just my, my opinion. Um, for, we have not talked at all about COVID and the impact that COVID has had on really slowing down the progress that was, uh, there was, I won't say a, a stop button, um, but there's definitely been a pause button in, so I, I personally think, and this is partly informed on interviewing a lot of city council people in the last couple of months, or potential city council people, there's so little understanding about local law 97. And um, I, so in terms of policy, that's why I keep saying, let's, let's get in the action, let's get in the conversation because my concern is that local law in 97 is, um, is gonna run into a lot of difficulties um, and is going to, there are gonna be people that are going to attempt to water it down. And there are a lot of people don't understand it, both, both people who are going to get elected and also in among professionals and lay people. So I keep coming back to, we gotta get in the conversation. Um, it's not so much that the policies are bad policies, but maybe they haven't been completely thought through. Um, and uh, like, where do you put heat, heat pumps? How do you actually uh, electrify uh, and uh, according to different building typologies? Um, so- uh, should, should there be more incentive from government to, to let's say, you know, lower that threshold for buildings that are smaller, that are less than 25 square feet, 25,000 square feet up to a given, a given uh, size for to encourage the, the a more you know environmentally minded uh, retrofit that 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 so that we are not relying only on the biggest polluters we have to tackle that but then there is this, this larger component of existing buildings should should that be part of the the conversation in terms of encouraging more of that type of uh, intervention whether it's public or private I, I don't know I mean I feel that everybody needs to walk down this path, you know, big building, small building, professional office, residential, whatever. But I really think it comes back to green jobs and, and preservation jobs. And when Melissa was talking and I, I wrote it down on her training campus, there's also a really good tech school up in Hudson Valley, closer to Albany, I can't remember the name. Oh, yes, I do know the name of it. Um, I think I wrote it down someplace. Uh, tech. Oh. Uh, check something. Anyway, um, I, it comes down to uh, green jobs because if you're talking about air sealing a window, I've personally been trying to get three windows uh, 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 air sealed, good quality mahogany windows on chains in a, a client's apartment and um, nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to do the job because the profit margin is not good enough. So that's sustainability, that's historic preservation. 
it's really hard to find the people who are willing to do some of these jobs and it's really hard to find people that are going to price it in, in, a, in a way that's affordable so um, I don't know if that really answers your question but obviously I have strong feelings about it. <laughs> We think a lot about windows. Our, our biggest part of our schoolhouse was the windows and we had to build our own crew and we actually then became like a champion to other projects around just saying, just build, get your window crew, you guys make it or else you're gonna be in that position. And we ended up uh, really selling that model to other friends who were developing houses or buildings. And the window shop of our schoolhouse restoration was one of the longest and most arduous and we went with, of course, restoring the old, but also building the storm windows. And, um, and that was one of the biggest jobs at our, uh, on our restaurant. It is a, t a, t a tough one, but imagine if you had a great couple of carpenters, a lot of them work alone. You know, they work like one person. Teams need to be built out with an eye of what do we need? We need to know somebody who knows about the energy um, audits and the uh, and the carpenter and the HVAC guy you need to build out your team to be like preservation energy efficient and and that's the problem is that and and right now the Hudson Valley I don't know who's following what but you know New York City exodus has gone north and there is no way that these contractors can keep up with anything let alone get educated and green so I see it as like a state where uh, the state will have to start paying, paying companies to be able to train, hire, expand their knowledge base. You know, that's the type of thing I would be advocating for locally is just the contractors can't even keep up, let alone have one of each guy, one of each girl, whatever it is, one of each person. <laughs> but it's, um, it's, a, it's a definite, you know, we're feeling the, the pressure of lots of mechanics and needs need to be met all at the same time. And I like to walk away from these conversations hopeful and not freaked out, uh, but, and I do, because I can see that on the call, it's a general group of, you were asking earlier, is this an opportunity? If you're a problem solver type, everything's an opportunity. Yeah. Just start doing it. <laughs> just just make, make it work for you, for it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I think this is a, 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 a way, a better moment than where we were several months ago, right? I mean, I'm 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 getting my second vaccine in a matter of days, and I cannot wait. I'm so excited. First, I'm gonna get a haircut, uh, and I'm gonna feel comfortable staying in, in, in an unventilated room for 45 minutes. But that, that being said, the, this is a moment full of opportunity because of, there is a change of leadership. And again, this is a matter of politics and policies and how everyone's pol where everyone's politics are. But I think the fact that you have someone at the at the, the top of the federal government who's acknowledging climate change, who's also establishing policies uh, to tackle that, to make this a priority, and then include and then also come on with a funding plan for that, you know, which could be and will be criticized and discussed and so on. And there's a lot to talk about that. But I think that's a fundamental change that is really hopeful and, and, and exciting. And I think that what I, what, I, what I believe is also that I wonder if, if with so much talk about uh, infrastructure and all this funding for infrastructure, knowing that a lot of our existing historic fabrics and not just our transportation facilities and uh, our railroads and, and, and bridges and, 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 and train stations, but also the, the historic fabric that becomes really the, 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 the core of our communities, also part of the infrastructure that defines the nation. I really believe that there's an opportunity there. It's just a matter of trying to understand what they have in mind in the, federal, in the White House when they're putting those bills together. And I think it's really a call for action for us from the preservation field to try to to tune in, and I think even that just address what you said. Let's just make sure we get a we got a, a seat on the table. There is an advisory council for historic preservation that advises the president in terms of preservation issues. So it's not that we don't have a seat on the table. The question is like, what are they saying? What what's going on, and to what extent they're being impactful? And if they're not, then there's a change to be made. But I think there is an opportunity there, or I wonder, I want to ask you, is this an opportunity? Is this really, is anyone, is this a, is there a good reason to be excited as I may be, uh, crazy as I am, for what, what is happening? And is this, and if, if, do you see a real opportunity here 
for these issues of historic preservation and sustainability with the funding and the vision that is being put into place and how, how do we tackle that? Yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things where this is not a new concept. I mean, I think the in the 1970s, I think the National Trust ran their whole like oil can campaign with, with the gas crisis. So the idea of preservation and sustainability or uh, the greenest building is the one that's already built that Carl Elefante often gets uh, noted with saying it's not a new idea. So I'm just hoping that now it's an idea whose time has finally come. And it's also that thing of educating local projects, local governments on how we can get that. I mean, like the, the trillion that is coming, the Green New Deal, the infrastructure injection, the thing, you know, you to, we have to train the workers, but we also have to train the grant writers, like immediately. We have to start sort of being informing. There is going to be money coming. And in many ways, I've been sort of seeing us as a vehicle to empower our local government to get the grants that they will deserve because of the level of historic buildings we have, the level of, of um, uh, social inequity we have, like it's Hudson has all of these perfect, but, but they just have to have the wherewithal to be able to put their hand out <laughs> to get that support to change their light bulbs or whatever it's going to be. And that's, I feel like what's key and where local community, smaller groups can play a role is just how can we connect the dots so that your municipality or your neighborhood or your project get some of that funding because I believe it will be there almost like weirdly the vaccines maybe they'll be too many and they don't know how to distribute it like where are we going to avenue the 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 investments um or that's not a sentence but you get what I mean is how can we <laughs> pull money from trees and make it green again <laughs> yeah I mean for a long time part of the pessimism has been like well where are we going to get the money from um now um that's why it's hopeful, is I believe to, to, to activate the printing the, uh, uh, presses and, and, and print cash. So let's take advantage of that. Um, I see here who's probably calling to tell us that we're running out of time, but I've Coming back up just to say that we are just about a time, but um, this has been an amazing conversation. I've been so excited to just sit back and, and watch you all speak. Um, I wanna give you a chance if anybody has any last minute things that they would like to say before we, uh, before we end here. Find me in Hudson. I'd like to uh, continue the conversation with any one of you. <laughs> I've been really happy to be here. So thank you. And I will be getting in touch with some of you. Yeah, same. Hey, I think, I, oh, go ahead, I'm Evan. sorry, Kayla, go ahead. No, go ahead, Evan. No, I was just going to say, I don't know if, it, if people are open to this or if we need to give per permission, but it would be fun to sort of know who's on this call, like in a, in a real room, we'd actually be able to see people and talk. But, you know, this is, the, this is, a, a, nu this is a potential nucleus for a, an active group of people who can, you know, band together and take it from here. Yeah, and thank you. It's been really fun talking with everyone today and I'm definitely gonna bug Melissa and Evan and, and Hell a little bit more. Um, and so I like talking about this stuff. And so I did start a podcast that was my pandemic project um, called Tangible Remnants. And I look at the intersection of race, sustainability, architecture, preservation, and gender. So find me at Tangible Remnants. Let's have a, a, a co-hosted podcast. Let's continue this conversation. Done and done. <laughs> yes. I think it's like a green conversations. And I would love to do a joint conversation and see how Baltimore and Hudson, New York, thank you. Yeah, that'd be awesome. See you there. <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, as they say. Uh, but I really want to just, just say that this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation with all of you and, and I see uh, a lot of comments and, and, and kudos coming in, in the, to the chat. So thank you. I, I, I have no more to add. I think this was really fun and, and, and too bad we had to stop and I had to shut up, but I'm, I'm delighted to. <laughs> no, this is great. Thank you all so much for being here. This was being recorded. So uh, it will be on the league's YouTube page within the next couple of days. Uh, I'll also get it up on Facebook. I had a little bit of technical difficulty with the live stream, but that'll be there as well. So um, you, can, you can find it later. And thank you for being here, for tuning in. Thank you to our panelists. You all are amazing. You're doing great work. And climate change is one of the biggest problems that affects the entire world. It's a local issue. It's a global issue. Everybody has a role to play in combating it and figuring out how we move forward. And that includes the preservation field. So I'm very excited that we're having these conversations and looking forward to keeping them going so that 
preservation is part of the solution to make more just and sustainable communities going forward. So thank you all and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you.